Bulletin bloopers. The outreach committee has enlisted, these are actual bloopers. The outreach committee has enlisted 25 visitors to make calls on people who are not afflicted with any church. <laughs> I think they meant connected with any church. Or, or affiliated. That's or affiliated, that's better. Yes, that's it. Syria. That's it. Uh, what's another? Ushers will eat latecomers. <laughs> I think they mean greet latecomers. I don't know if I should read this one. <clears throat> the pastor would appreciate it if the ladies of the congregation would lend him their electric girdles for the pancake breakfast next Sunday morning. <laughs> had, to write, had to write letters in the wrong places. It's a word, right? Spell check didn't, spell check didn't change it. All right. Enough fun. Let's get down to church now, right? That's the way a lot of people think, but it, we, we do live in serious times. We're studying a very interesting worm, lesson four. Never anticipated it going four lessons. I'm not seeking to uh, enlarge the amount of material, not, not seeking to um, ta take this, extend, that's the word I want, extend this any longer than uh, we currently are, but uh, we did, I did intend to go three lessons. Here we are in our fourth lesson. Hopefully we'll wrap it up today. There is so much material. We have scratched the surface. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of references in regards to angels, both good and bad, as we discussed in the very first lesson, evil and good angels. We we're going to concentrate, of course, the majority of our time, as we have been teaching on good angels, holy angels, angels that are obedient unto God and serving Him. So we may lapse into other areas where we will um, reference scripture that is referring to those fallen angels, evil angels. We'll make note of that when we do that. So we left off last week on the response in the area of the responsibilities of angels. Angels have an assignment. They are on assignment and uh, they are active. They have duties that they perform. Uh, there's just so much interesting uh, information in the scriptures and I have learned as always the teacher learns more probably than the students simply because of the hours of study that I need to put in just to present what 30, 40 minutes of, of lesson here. So we're going to continue from last week and the point that we were at is that they are named as message bearers and we see that as a significant role in both the Old and New Testament that uh, one of the primary ways in which humanity or humans encounter angels in the scripture is in the course of a message announcement, something coming from God directly to the individual. Now let me hit the pause button here for just a moment and tell you that there are a variety of methods in, and, and um, modes of communication that God can use to get a message to us. The first and primary mode of message to us that God can use by His Holy Spirit is what? Bible. The Bible. Exactly. The Word of God. God. God, how many of you recognize times when you'll be reading a scripture and the Holy Spirit will quicken something to you and maybe you have read that scripture many, many times, but all of a sudden it takes on a meaning and, and, and a, a weight that it has not before. That's God using the Bible to communicate. The second way that God communicates with us is through directly through His Holy Spirit, speaking to us, guiding and directing us. That will, of course, always be in line with the Scripture. And sometimes the Holy Spirit, when we're not reading, will quicken Scripture to us. It's an amazing way. God can use a variety of methods to, to speak to us. There have been times when I have been going through um, certain challenges in my, in my spiritual walk, perhaps been in a time, time of, of difficulty or battle. And we, uh, you know, in the, in the middle of the night, all of a sudden I, I will wake up and 
Maybe I have to get up in the middle of the night and I'll realize that there's a song going through my mind. I didn't have that, I hadn't played that song. I wasn't humming that song in my head when I went to sleep. But the Holy Spirit has quickened a song in my head and, and that is a message from God. That's your spirit connecting with the Holy Spirit. But the third way, and a way that we see often in the scriptures, noted in the scriptures for you and I, and of course evidencing the fact that angels are message bearers. We see that in the scriptures that I've, I've put up on the board here, that out of many, we chose just a few. But what might surprise you is the Bible tells us that it was angels who gave the law who were givers, transmitters, communicators of the law in the Old Testament. Acts 7.39 says the law as delivered by angels. Hebrews 2.2, 2, the word spoken through angels. Galatians 3.19, the law was given through angels. You say, wait a minute, I thought God gave the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments to Moses on, on Mount Sinai. He did, but remember there were other portions of the law that were delivered and God used angels to deliver those portions of the law. They're also interpreters. So angels, angels will give messages or they will give the word of God. We find those uh, emphasis in the scripture, those, those times in the scripture, but they also can be commentators and, and interpreters. In Daniel, the eighth chapter, the angel said to Daniel, I will make known to you what shall be. They could be seen as teachers even, instructors at times. It says, Daniel 9, 23, consider the word, he's speaking to Daniel, consider the word and understand the vision. So the angel is taking time to interpret, to, to teach, to instruct Daniel and so the message not only is given, but the angel makes sure, evidently by the instruction of God, under the command of God, to make sure that Daniel or any individual understands. We recall, and, and I need to keep moving here, but scripture pops into my head of, of the intercourse that, of communication that, that, um, that Zechariah had and then Mary had with Gabriel in regards to the announcement of John the Baptist that they would give birth and Zechariah had a question and Mary had a question and the response was different the result was different Zechariah was struck dumb and Mary it was explained to her the angel made sure she understood delivered the message but when there was a question the angel said here's what that means this will happen very interesting that the angel expanded the message and said, this is how this is all going to work. So they also give announcements, and I've already covered that. Uh, they give announcements. Angels can appear in dreams. And we find that in particular with Joseph, uh, the husband of Mary, the father, the earthly father of Jesus, the angel spoke consistently in a dream to Joseph and warned him and told him, this is what's happening. Take the child to Egypt. Do this, do that. And it says Joseph, when he woke up, he did immediately what the angel told him to do. So there was something about the dream that was very, very real. And Joseph knew that this was a message from God. Angels are also protectors. In Daniel, Daniel had a lot of interchange with, the, with, with angels. Daniel, in case you didn't know it, and hopefully this has whet your appetite to read the book of Daniel, Daniel was highly valued by God, and Daniel was a pivotal individual, personality, in the revelation of what God, not, not only in preserving God's remnant and preserving who God would have to survive captivity, but Daniel was also very pivotal in releasing, receiving and releasing a very crucial message to his people. And so Daniel had a lot of interchange with angels and we find that Daniel was cast into the lion's den. You know, it wasn't all, it wasn't all uh, roses for Daniel. I mean, he, he went through some times. We can't imagine, we can imagine but the reality of that 
is incredible. Daniel, no doubt, was ready to die. The, the, the lions were starving. They were, they were hungry. And that is evidenced by the fact that the others that were thrown in after Daniel was saved, the Bible goes on to say that the lions consumed them, ate them, broke their bones before they hit the ground. So that was a pack of lions, and they were, they were hungry. And yet the Bible says, my God, in Daniel 6.22, sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. So they're, they are protectors. Again, we've talked about their power and their abilities. You know, it's kind of, I mean, it's pretty amazing what they can do. Shut the mouths of lions. That's, that's some power. Lions are powerful. Acts 12.7, this is a reference to Peter. If you remember, Peter has been, um, James has been killed by the sword. Herod sees that that has pleased the Jews. So he decided to, to arrest Peter as well. And he said, okay, this, we're, we're going to follow this pathway. And he puts Peter into prison. But the church prayed for Peter. And it's an interesting story. But the church prayed for Peter. They were in a prayer meeting. We don't know how long, but evidently a prolonged prayer meeting. At, and a, a young maiden named Rhoda went out to meet Peter after he was released. But the Bible says that Peter released from prison, Peter said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod. So an angel actually slapped him on the side. It's indicated in the book of Acts. And woke him up. Actually says hit him. Woke him up. Get up. And of course our text that we have used through these different courses or these different series are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. And then angels are warriors. I think we know that. Sorry, let me... No, I don't want to activate settings right now. Don't you love smartphones? These kids that program these things think that you're just on here all the time. Do you want to activate your settings? No. I want the... There you go. It was telling me I need to teach the Sunday school class. Yeah. And it was distracting me, so. It, well, no. <laughs> or demon, one or the other, I don't know. Whichever one was irritating me. Warriors, Joshua 5.14. I, I love this story. Joshua's getting ready. Joshua was a warrior. He was, of course, the assistant to Moses. And, and he was uh, a warrior from the beginning. And Joshua is ready to go into battle. And it says, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Joshua, by the way, we'll talk about testing angels. Joshua tests who this is. He said, whose side are you on? Ours or theirs? I love the answer. The angel said, neither. I'm not coming to be on your side or their side. You're on my side. He said, neither but as the commander of the Lord, army of the Lord. In other words, I'm coming to take over, Josh. I'm not coming to follow you. I have now come. When Joshua heard that, there was evidently something about the authority, the presence, who knows, the power of this being. And it says he fell face down. All of a sudden, it became a revelation to him that he was in the presence of an angel, potentially a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ and he fell face down to the ground in reverence. Why we believe that, and I have to keep from zigging when I should be zagging, but why we believe that, why would we believe this might be the pre-incarnate appearance of Christ? Any clue? What did I just say that might give that? Excellent. He fell down and faced round to the ground in reverence. And he said, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And the angel didn't say, stand up. Every other incident, we say, don't, don't worship me. I'm an angel. Don't, I'm just a servant of God. This angel did not. This angel allowed him to worship. So the Lord is the commander of the army of the Lord. Of course, the army of, of God. 2 Samuel 5.24 You've heard me reference this if you've attended here any length of time at all. David is ready to go out against it to battle the Philistine army. 
he asked the prophet of the Lord, when is the timing correct? And the prophet said, don't go out right away, but wait until you hear the, the King James Version says sound of the, of the mulberry trees uh, rushing in the mul wind in the mulberry trees. Actually, the Arabic version of that, wait until you hear the sound of marching of, over your head. When you hear the sound of an army, wouldn't that have been spine tingling? You hear a sound of an army marching over your head. It says the Lord, that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. And so the angels are warriors. They battle. And uh, we find another reference in 2 Kings. Will not, but 2 Kings is where the angel of the Lord uh, struck 185,000 Assyrians. So, we're going to get into the summary, but the summary is going to be prolonged here, I believe. We need to summarize this and wrap this all up. Truly, angels are impressive beings, to say the least, and it caused us to be amazed. And we've not covered half of what the Bible tells us. But, and so we, we should rejoice in their invisible presence and ministry. That's right. We're, we're thankful that God has created these beings and that they are ministering spirits to those of us who are on our journey dur through this life, facing all that we face, battling the enemy, facing temptation, and just living life in general. Life presents challenges in general that have nothing to do uh, with spiritual beings. You know, um, just stuff, right? The Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. So uh, we, just, we just have some things that we battle through. And some things are a result of our own actions. They have nothing to do with blaming God or blaming the enemy or it being God's will or it being the resistance of the enemy. If I don't brush my teeth for five years, I can't blame God if I go to the dentist and he says, you've got four cavities, right? No, I rebuke that. No. No, that's because you didn't brush your teeth. And so there's some things that are natural outcome just because of life. But we're thankful that we have angels uh, on our side to help us. And so we have three thoughts regarding angels that as we wrap this up. Angels are to be respected, but not worshipped. Angels are to be respected, but not worshipped. I'll, I'll tell you right now that if an angel would all of a sudden become visible and pop right up next to me or behind me on this stage, you and I are going to be in awe, right? I mean, it's, it's like, whoa, and you'll be telling, you will not believe what happened during our morning class, but they're not to be worshipped. And we've already covered that nowhere in the scripture. In fact, every, every time a human being has encountered an angel, and they are impressive, every time a human being has encountered an angel, there is a natural, evidently, they are so awesome, there's a natural desire to fall to your knees. And every time they stop them. Because they know, honestly, they know who the boss is. And it's not them. And they, they know who they get their orders from. And they know that there's a difference, as we've said before, between power and all power. <laughs> they know that. They go in and out of the presence of God. They have that authority. They have that right. They have that pass. You know, there's some people have passes to get into places. And they have a pass to go from this earth to the third heaven and back and forth. So they say, do not worship me. Revelation 19.10, I didn't put that up there, but Revelation 19.10, I should have. In Revelation 19, John, see, and this is my point. John the Revelator, they call him, John the one who laid on Jesus' chest and loved him, and the one whom Jesus loved, John refers to himself is on the Isle of Patmos, and he has been given the privilege of receiving these awesome visions that we call, that accumulate into what we call the book of Revelation. And John has encountered the Lord at the beginning, and he has seen the Lord, and the Lord's presence is incredible, and then there's an angel that accompanies him, and he is so blown away by this that in Revelation 19, even after all of this and all the reminders, John said, John fell down 
at the angel's feet and began to worship, even after all that, John, John, they're so impressive, and the revelation was so impressive, and the angel said, don't do that, exclamation mark. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. That's pretty lofty company. The angel is telling John, I'm a fellow servant along with you. So you and I, as we follow Christ, are considered by the angels fellow servants, peers, I'm a servant with you. We're together. We're in this together. We're in the same battle together. Don't worship, don't worship me. The angel goes on and says, Worship God! Exclamation mark. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. So, they are to be respected, not worshipped. All right, I love this board. It's, it's just zippity-doo-dah. Here we go. And they are to be seen as present, but not pursued. We have a lot of books on angels. We have a lot of people on, about angels. You can Google angels. You can get yourself in trouble. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Do not pursue angels. That nowhere are we told that we're to focus on angels. We're to focus on the Lord. We're to focus on God. We're to focus on the Holy Spirit not on angels. People talk about my angel, and my angel told me to do this, and my angel told me to do that. Careful. Careful. We'll talk about that in a moment. We're not encouraged to address angels directly. We're certainly never in the scripture told to pray to them. You never pray to an angel. Prayer is to God. Um, our prayer should always be directed to Him. So, um, they are to be seen as present, but not pursued. And then last, they are to be tested if encountered. They're to be tested if encountered. I'm going to jump ahead of some things here. We may come back to some other things, but tested if they are encountered. So if angels are encountered, <clears throat> we evidently encounter them. Perhaps, and I don't know, there, there may be a high probability that all of us have, unawares. The Bible talks about entertaining angels unawares. We run into them and we don't know it. They're so good, they're better than AI at mimicking people. I mean, they, they will have warts and all. They're not going to look like perfectly beautiful that, you, that make, make and have a little luminous appearance to them. The Bible says they look just like people. So who knows? Now I can see the wheels turning. But who knows? So the Bible says we, we can encounter them. Maybe we do all encounter them. But if there is a personal encounter with a being that is not of this earth, we, the Bible tells us that we are to test them. 1 John 4, 1 says, do, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. Now, it, now, John is here talking about people that are teaching false doctrine. But spirit is a word that is connected with angelic beings. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Test them. Now we go back to Joshua again. Joshua said, whose side are you on? Started questioning this visitor. And so we are to test them. Why is that? Well, the Bible tells us very clearly in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, Satan masquerades, can masquerade as an angel of light. So he doesn't always come. You know, they, they picture Satan as, you know, I don't know where they got the red with the horns and the tail and all of that. No, he, he, that's, that's not how he does his work. And he can appear as an angel of light. So have, have individuals, has Satan appeared to individuals? Yes, down through, he can, he can appear, but do not go through life worrying. Satan is not omnipresent. He is not like God. He cannot be everywhere at once. Did you ever think about that? He can only be in one location. 
Now, he can move quick, I'm sure, but he can only be in one place. God's everywhere at once. He's here and he's helping some guy change his tire right now out in Iowa. You know, I mean, God is everywhere. Satan has to come and go. In fact, the Bible talks about him coming and going when he accused Job. Coming and going before the throne of God. So Satan uses his demonic or his fallen angels to cover the globe and do his work. We've talked about that, that they're evidently organized. So Satan can appear to people. Uh, there is a historical reference of Martin Luther who was making a huge paradigm change in the church. He had discovered that the just shall live by faith. I mean, the church in, at that point was literally bound up in all of these rules by the, by the, the Catholic church and the priest, and you had to pay this and you had to pay that, and people giving their last penny because they were told somebody's every, everything but their foot was out of, out of purgatory. I mean, the lies and the corruption was incredible. And Martin Luther, in his hunger, hunger after God, discovered a verse that, and remember, the Holy Spirit speaking through the word, quickened a verse to him. And it stood out. This was a very learned man. Boom, all of a sudden the just shall live by faith. And the lights went on. And he was the founder, he was the father of the Protestant, and he, a Protestant movement. And he nailed the thesis to the door. Do you remember that? And, and um, the diet of worms and all of that that took place. Uh, no, he didn't have to eat worms. But anyhow, the, all, all that took place. Well, he was obviously a major player on earth at that time, out of all of humanity, he was leading, he was going to lead people out of darkness, multiple millions. He didn't know that, but multiple millions would be led out of darkness and religious bondage. And he didn't know that, but there is an occasion where he said Satan appeared to him while he was working and he threw an inkwell at him across the room. So that's how real it was. Now, the Bible nowhere tells us that if Satan appears before you, throw an inkwell at him or throw something at him. Probably not very effective, but it indicates the warrior that Martin Luther was. And uh, so if, if the Bible says that Satan can appear as an angel of light, so we are to test them. The Bible says that Satan, as far as we understand, well, we know that Satan is a fallen angel. And it is believed by some that in Isaiah, the 14th chapter, that the 14th chapter of Isaiah contains the story of Satan's fall. Isaiah 14, 12 refers to the morning star. And when you translate morning star, that's the name Lucifer. So there's some division here among scholars. It certainly could be there might be a duality, a duality of application of the scripture. Because for one, we do know that this is a reference to the king of Babylon. Because this is referring, this is Isaiah and Babylon. And, and Isaiah is delivering a prophecy to his people, to God's people. And he says the king of Babylon is going to come down. So we know that it's a reference to the king of Babylon. But there are many that hold this as a reference to Satan, to the devil, and um, he was called, they believe he was called the morning star, which would answer the question as to how could he appear as an angel of light. There's other scripture that talks about, um, they believe to be references to Satan, that even in his construction, there were musical instruments in him, that perhaps he was the leader of worship and in heaven. The Bible does not say this is, and with a note, this is a reference to the devil. But we certainly know, and we certainly, it is believed, that the devil was an archangel. Very, very powerful. And um, had evidently undermined God and influenced other angels to come with him. Who knows? Who knows what went on? We do know that Jesus refers to the struggle between, uh, there, there was no, 
God is not at war with the devil. The devil's not at war. It, there is no battle because there's no comparison. We are at war with the devil. The church is at war with the devil. Angels are at war with the devil. There, there's no war between God and the devil because, again, God is all-powerful. Jesus said, I saw the devil fall like lightning. It was that fast. Rebellion, over. Done. And so it's, it's, there's a lot of things that are mysteries about, about all of this. So we are to test them. How are we to test them? First of all, by the word. We are to test them by the word, the word of God. Because uh, the Bible says that Satan is the ultimate deceiver and he's the father of lies. So that characteristic passes on to those who follow him. It's interesting that that characteristic passes on to human beings. The Bible tells us that we are either, we either belong to God or we belong to the devil. You know that, right? There's no in between. We are not, we do not own ourselves. Jesus said to the, to the Pharisees one day, you are of your father, the devil. You are of your father, the devil. And in another place, he told his disciples, pray this, our father who is in heaven. Notice that he clarifies there's a father in heaven. So there must be a father somewhere else. And when we die, we go, to, we go home. We go, we go to our father's house. And the Bible says hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. So your spirit knows where, where to go when it's released from our body. You go to your father. And your father is either the devil or your father is God. Pretty sobering, isn't it? Pretty sobering. So we, we, he is the father of lies. And it is an, it, interesting that people who follow before we came to Christ, and we all had to come to the Lord, before we came to Him, we took on the characteristics of the devil. That was the evil that was manifested in us. And one of the things is lying. Lying was just natural. Lying comes normal. We don't te you don't teach little children to lie. Isn't that amazing? They figure it out. And, they get, and they're good at it. Not as good as they think they are, if you're a smart parent. But they're pretty good at it. Did you do that? No. <laughs> right? My parents tell me that I was good at shifting the blame to somebody else. They say that I would go walking through with a mess diaper. And the aroma evidently was filling the house. And they would look at me and one of them say, what did you do? And I'd go, oh. <laughs> and I'd point at somebody else. Now, how in the world? That's just in us. We're just born with that in us. It's called the Adamic nature. We're born with Adam's nature in us. And part of that is lying. And so the enemy, of course, we need to test. Test by the word of God. If they say anything. That's why it's so important to know the word. You're not going to have time to say, wait a minute, let me look that up. Test by the word of God and discernment. The Holy Spirit within you. That's called discerning. Something, something is either right here or not right here. All right. Let's talk for a moment about talking directly to angels. And I have two minutes. Is there a time when we may talk to angels? Well, there's a possibility, but the greatest probability of encountering a spiritual power other than the Holy Spirit and God is everywhere. Don't misunderstand me. But the necessity of speaking directly to would be when we are... Uh, when we encounter a demon or a demonic force. Then 
if there is a confrontation, the, the, it is God has given authority to us as believers to directly confront, not converse, not converse, confront and command demonic powers. And so the Bible never tells us to converse with them, to go back and forth and question this, that. Confront, command. In the Bible, we never see, only time we see Jesus conversing is when he asks how many are in the, and they said 5,000. If you can imagine, 5,000 in one man. Gave supernatural power, broke chains. Um, and Jesus has such authority that there wasn't any battle. Do you notice that? The Bible uses the word permission. He gave them permission to leave. That's, boom, one word, you have permission to go. And they said, okay, we're going, we know who you are. That's awesome. We serve an awesome Lord. So it is through him that we, if we must, we confront demonic powers. Through him, not in our own authority. It is authority in Christ, in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. But you have been given authority. You don't go looking for them. We find sometimes that there's some overzealous Christians who think they're demon busters and they're just running everywhere. Binding and loosing and binding and loosing. We don't see that. We see the apostles and the disciples, when confronted or necessary, dealing with it. Paul, on another occasion in the book of Acts, there was a, a girl that they were using to tell the future. She was a, a, a um, soothsayer, or she was a... a, a um, fortune teller. And she followed Paul and the other disciple and said, these men are from God and see, speaking the truth. But it got, and Paul didn't even confront that demon on the first day. After several days, Paul got fed up with it. And he turned and he commanded it to leave. And he told it to shut up. That, the word rebuke, or that, it literally means shut up. It means stop it. When Jesus rebuked, it means stop it. That's what it means. And he rebuked it, and it left. And it was over. And Paul and Silas got thrown into jail because they lost a lot of money. They were making a lot of money through that girl. And she couldn't do it any longer. So what's that tell you about fortune tellers? Don't have anything to do with them. Because they're not operating by the Spirit of God. They may say things about God. They may say things that sound religious. But they're not operating by the Spirit of God. They're operating under the power of occult or demonic power. Okay, we've got to stop. We've got to stop. But um, an authority, by the way, demonic powers will... An individual who is possessed, the Bible refers to as demonized, not possessed, demonized. Person who has been taken over by a demon. And um, there are, demons recognize authority. They also, there are varying levels of authority. Different believers, different Christians have varying levels of authority and demonic powers recognize that. The seven sons of Siva tried to use the name of Jesus to cast out demons. And one man jumped on them and beat all seven of them up. And the demon said out of the man's mouth, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? It's an honor to be known in hell. How about that? Or by the powers of hell. In other words, they weren't true followers of Christ. And they didn't have authority. They were using the right words, but didn't have authority. Authority levels can depend upon the belief and the faith of the individual and also depend upon the preparation of the spirit. Paul, or excuse me, Jesus told his disciples, this kind comes forth but by prayer and fasting. 
So authority can be enhanced and belief and faith can be enhanced after prayer and fasting. Okay. Interesting subject. One that is particularly appropriate for today because we are living in a day when that is becoming more and more evident and probable. Angels of God. We've got to quit today. It's, it's, um, we could go for another, probably another uh, one more series, but we'll stop for today.